Hello, everyone, and welcome to Africa Fire Mission's weekly virtual training session. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm the programs director for Africa Fire Mission, and we're so uh, happy you guys took time out of your busy schedules to come and join us for this week's training session. Uh, today, we've got Howard Cohen back with us. Uh, Howard is our virtual training coordinator uh, with AFM, does a lot of training for us, does a lot of work for us. He's back again uh, with a little bit, something a little bit different uh, than maybe you're used to, so he's promised an exciting class uh, for today. Uh, a few administrative items. If you stick around for at least 70% of today's training, which is usually about 40 or 45 minutes, you will receive a certificate of attendance for today's training. Uh, I'll also give you a link in the chat uh, where you can get to our Google Drive uh, and you can uh, get a recording of today's video or any of the other trainings that we've done previously in the year. And if you attend that and answer a few questions, you'll be able to get a certificate of attendance for that one as well. Before we get started, I'm going to pass things over to Jose Nanjiri. Jose is Africa Fire Mission's fire safety officer, and he's going to get us started with a few words of encouragement. Thank you, Mike. I truly appreciate you. Thank you so much, Howard, again, for uh, always joining us in and uh, giving us a lot of online trainings. We appreciate you also for uh, sacrificing your bundles, all the all parts of Africa being uh, represented from Congo, Malawi, Zambia. Thank you, guys. And not forgetting Kenya. So today I'm just thinking about the topic that uh, uh, Chief Howard is about to talk about. And then, and of course, I love uh, articles from the firerescue1.com. And one, way, one of the articles was saying 10 ways firefighters can support their own mental health. There are 10 ways, though I'm not going to list all of them. I just encourage you to go there and check which are those other ways that you can actually uh, support your own mental health. Uh, as you know, this job of ours is very stressful. You know, it takes a toll on us. And uh, because of our variable duties and schedules and uh, with no rest at all, you, you really, really need some, uh, some ways you can deal with your mental health. So <laughs> what are your, those uh, tips? Number one, you can prioritize your sleep. Prioritize your sleep, yeah? If you've been sleeping quite late and when it's time for you to sleep, please sleep. At least give yourself eight hours of sleep, an interrupted sleep. Switch off your phone or put it on vibration or mute, and then you shall deal with the calls later on. This will help your brain and uh, to rejuvenate. Number two, improve your diet. Not just eat quantity, but you eat quality. You have some fruits, you have some uh, protein, some vegetables, those will help you out and drink loads of water. And exercise, not only in the gym, but also go and do outdoor exercises. Let the sun burn you. Let that energy from the outside reach out to you as you work out, yeah? And also do uh, issues like uh, another way of doing it is go have some hobbies, mountain hiking, if it's skating, riding the bike, uh, repairing the car, things that you love. And the last one on this list, though there are about 10, include your family if you have a family. Do uh, errands with your family, spend time with your family, do some barbecue with your family, spend time with your family. Through that, you will be able to rejuvenate yourself and your mind will be uh, at ease. Thank you so much for this uh, time. Back to you, Chief Mike. Thank you, Jose. We always appreciate you and your words of encouragement and all the work you do for us and for all of the firefighters there throughout all of Africa. Uh, I would invite everyone to stick around after we complete today's training. Uh, we'll have a tea time that Jose will host. Tea time is a, a time where you can ask some questions about today's training or discuss anything else that uh, may be on your mind. 
So I invite you to stick around for that as well. Uh, without further ado, uh, I think I'm going to pass things over to Howard to get us started for the day. Hi, everybody. Um, let me get myself situated here. Uh, I'm going to have to share the screen. Not sure what picture is going to come up first. Oh, perfect. There we go. Okay. So um, uh, let's see one more. There we go. So um, I'm happy to be back with all of you. And um, well, a quick question. A am I showing up? Is, is my picture showing up on your screen? Okay, good. Um, I got a different setup on my for my PowerPoint today. So um, I'm going to talk about, oh, I didn't change my front page. I'm going to talk about um, leadership. Uh, ignore what it says there about the thrive, thrive brain and the three U's of leadership, et cetera, et cetera. I forgot to, to change that slide. But what I'm going to talk to you about is um, how to develop your, your leadership skills. You'll understand more as I go through this. But before I do that, I want to show you something. I want to teach you all a magic trick. So you see my rope here? And Howard, why don't you stop your screen share for just a minute? Oh, okay, good idea. <laughs> Sorry. Here we go. All right, you see my rope? It's a perfectly ordinary rope. I, it kind of disappears in and out of the because of the the, the camera. And, okay, and I have this is a very high class, <laughs> high class um, toilet paper roll. It's actually covered with aluminum foil. So. I'm going to take this rope and I'm going to tie a knot in it. I might have to stop my shares. My, uh, let me turn off my, my uh, background because I think it's blurring things. I think it's better. Okay. Now you see, I have a knot in this. Now I'm going to take this rope and slide it into my toilet paper roll. You can see there's the knot. Now watch. Now watch what happens. The knot has disappeared. I don't know if that if you're impressed by that magic trick, but at the end of the uh, the presentation, I, I will teach you how to do that. It's very simple. It's a lot of fun to do. Plus, I have another magic trick that you all are going to really want to know how to do. All right. Which I, but I won't tell you how you do it. I'm just going to show it to you. Let me get back to um, my presentation. All right. So I'm going to talk about leadership, but not in a way that you're used to or have probably ever had experience before. So um, last week, um, Mark talked a lot about leadership. And this week, I am too. But what I'm going to talk about is going to be radically different than what he talked about. Not because either one of our leadership talks are wrong, but mine's just going to be very different. So I want to start off with a definition. My definition is this. This was supposed to uh, not supposed to slide in. OK, so leaders. I know it's wrong. There we go. Hold on a second. I have some fancy stuff in my uh, slideshow and I have to, but I have to have it done right. Oh, just a second. Sorry. Sorry for this. I got to get this. My screen bigger. There we go. Doing something different this time. And that's, this is the problem. All right. So leaders inspire others. Now, I want to emphasize that word inspire, pay attention to it, because that's what we're striving to do, to inspire others into effective action. To achieve shared goals. So what we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about with you this morning is about this inspiring thing and the shared thing. So 
Come on, you're not supposed to be showing up there. Okay, so here's the thing about leadership training in the fire service. And I'm, this is true universally. There's good news and there's bad news about it. The good news is that there is more and more focus on the importance of leadership training. Every fire magazine you pick up is going to have an article about this. You're going to hear about it everywhere you go. In fact, we've spent we're having four sessions on leadership training, so it's really important. The bad news is that what we call leadership training is not really training. So I want to tell you, a recent survey in the United States of firefighters, particularly volunteer firefighters, who quit the fire service found that the number one reason for people leaving the fire service and from leaving something that they love doing was the, the problems with leadership. Never mind the issues of safety risks that go with poor leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Um, people left fire, the fire service because the leadership just wasn't very inspiring. They weren't sharing, they weren't, they weren't effectively pursuing shared goals. This is also true in the business world. Poor leadership is the number one reason why people leave well-paying jobs that they actually like. Yeah, it's crazy, but you have a high paying job, you like doing the work, but the leadership for who you're working for is lousy. And what do people do? They quit. They find something else to do. So what's missing in leadership training? Look, the vast majority of leadership training, no matter where it is, who does it for you, does two things really, really well. They give you the what. What are the qualities and characteristics of good leaders? All right. Well, by the way, all good fire, fire training should do the what and should tell you what it is you're going to be training on. That's what leadership training does. It tells you what good leaders have. They have what their qualities are, what their characteristics are. I don't need to list those for you now. I don't need to ask you what they are because you all know them. You've all heard them a thousand times from places. And what else is missing? Well, we get the why. I just told you why leadership training is important, right? We know it because it's important for safety. It's important for quality. It's important for, for the, the, everything. So we get the what and the, we, and the why, and we all know that. So here's something else. What's missing? What's missing is the how. How to be a good, how to do leadership. Yeah, how? Leadership, we talk about leadership skills. Skills have to be taught and they have to be, you have to train those skills in order to, to be able to master those skills. When you go to a training workshop, studies show that you will retain a, maybe 20% of the content of that workshop. Why? Because we don't, we haven't learned the muscle the muscle, we haven't trained the muscles to do the leadership skills that are required. Just like every other skill that you want to master in the fire service, you want to have muscle memory. Well, the skills of leadership require muscle me memory too. So what's missing? What's missing is true hands on, on a, is, is a true hands on training program for developing leadership skills. Like I said, all good fire service training addresses the what and the why, but not the how when it comes to leadership training. And that's what I'm going to do with you for the next little while. I'm going to introduce you to a training regiment for developing your leadership skills. Uh, oh, I missed a slide. To develop the leadership, leadership skills that you want and that you need, you have to work out the right muscles. So, um, you know, I could tell you that to be a good leader, you have to be empathetic. You have to be good at listening, or you have to have integrity. But if you don't know how to be empathetic, if you haven't been taught and trained in empathy, or listening, you're not going to succeed with it. 
So what's the muscle we need to train? I'm not going to ask you to answer that question, but if you want to throw your thoughts in the chat, go ahead. I'm just not going to be able, I can't look at the chat. So what's the muscle, muscle we need to train is our brain. Now, two weeks ago, I talked about our brain, and I'm going to repeat some of what I talked about. So if you missed it two weeks ago, you're going to get it now. And if you were here two weeks ago, here's a bit of a review. So we, we speak in, in general terms of having um, a right brain and a left brain. Actually, it's, it's all one brain, and they're interconnected. But what we know through, through brain mapping um, and through neurological studies is that on the right, brain, right part side of the brain are where what I'm going to call our sage powers emanate from. And I'll explain what I mean by sage powers in a little bit. But, and on the left side of the brain are where our saboteur, um, uh, our, what I'm going to call saboteurs emanate from. And saboteurs are, are certain characteristics or certain qualities, which I'm also going to explain a little bit about in the next couple of slides. So we've got these two parts of the brain. And as I'm going to show you, there's neural pathways that go from one, can go to one side or to the other. And if we want to be using the so-called sage powers in our brain, we have to train the brain muscle to do that. So here are what I, when I'm talking about saboteurs, this is what I'm talking about. There are actually 10 of them, 10 by name. Well, how can I say this? You know, um, well, there's a process called factional analysis. Factional analysis is when you, you basically divide something down to its, its essential elements. And what uh, social, sci social scientists and, ther and uh, psychologists and neurologists have discovered by analyzing uh, hundreds of different uh, uh, personal development, uh, social development, professional development kinds of programs is that there are these 10 core um, uh, characteristics that uh, I'm calling saboteurs. I'm just going to run through them really quick for you. Okay, saboteur number one, everybody, by the way, everybody has some portion of these, some of these saboteurs in different capacities. Some of us have more of them, some of us have, have less of them. So the number one saboteur, which everybody has, is called the judge. What I mean by the judge is that this saboteur judges ourselves, judges others, or judges our situation. So um, for example, uh, I judge you to not be competent. I judge you to be, uh, um, I judge myself to not be competent, or I judge a situation to be bad. I blame the situation for, my, for, for what's happening to me. So the judge is number one saboteur. And now, these are now in alphabetical order. The avoider saboteur is, keeps me from doing the things that I need to do. Um, I avoid doing them because they're unpleasant, because I'm, I'm afraid, because I don't think I'll succeed, or some other reason. It keeps me from doing what needs to be done. The controller, controller saboteur tries to control everything around him. The hyperachiever saboteur only does things at the very best that they can, they can, and they'll avoid doing things that they don't think they could be a super achiever at. And super achievers have a tendency to make other people feel less competent and then to get judged for not being as competent as the super achiever. Hypervigilant person is always looking over his shoulder, is afraid of something's happening, afraid of failing, afraid of being judged, afraid of, of not succeeding. The pleaser saboteur is always trying to make other people feel good, doesn't take care of his own or her own needs, but is always trying to please people and in the end pleases nobody. The restless saboteur keeps me from getting things done. I, I bounce from one to another, probably because I'm afraid of being judged for not doing it well, or I'm a hyperachiever and I don't feel like I can do it that well. Could be any number of factors, but the restless keeps me from getting things done. The stickler is over, is, 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 you know, is so concerned about things being exactly right, it drives everybody else crazy around them. You know, you didn't do this exactly the way I'd like it to be done. And so, um, you know, I'm judging you, you're not good, you're not right, you're not succeeding. And the victim saboteur says, it's like, oh, it's all, you know, woe is me, all these bad things are always happening to me. Oh, you know, what can I do about it? Now, these are the saboteurs, 
And we know that these generate or emanate from the left side of our brain. And we also know that all of these characteristics have a survival character uh, co component to them. They they developed at a at a earlier in, within our our uh, you know human brain development as means to to help us survive. So they're not necessarily bad qualities, but when they're over um, when they when they have more power than they should have, they can wreak havoc in our lives. You'll understand why I'm bringing this all out now and why how this relates to to uh, to leadership as I move through this. But we have we all have these. We all struggle with these at one level or another. Um, you can call them something different. You can call them something not not call them saboteurs. But the reason why I call them saboteurs is because number one, they sabotage our success and our happiness in life. Um, they hijack us, um, you know, as you'll see, and you'll see why this ties to, to leadership as I go through this. Now, what slide here? What do I have here? So back to my brain. So here's what we need to do. We need to develop a muscle within our brain. This is where the fitness comes in. We're going to develop the muscle called the interceptor saboteurs muscle. Now you can't look at, I can't point to the brain here and show you where the interceptor saboteur muscle is. But what I can tell you is that the intercept saboteurs muscle is really important to, to develop in order to be a good leader. Because what it does is it intercepts these saboteurs and says, basically says, this saboteur is trying to tell me a lie about whatever it is, the situation. And so I need to intercept it. And so it doesn't hijack my effectiveness to inspire my the people I want to inspire to help us move towards the, a, the shared goal we're after. So interceptors muscles, number one. Second muscle is called the self-command muscle. And I'm going to explain that also. The self-command muscle is a muscle that shifts us after we've intercepted the, high, the, the saboteur the self-command muscle shifts our neural pathways are, are to the right brain where our sage powers rest. Again, just stick with me as this all comes together. So here's how the intercept muscle works. Think of it this way. You grab a hot uh, a skillet that's been sitting on the stove. You grab it with your hand and the handle is hot. So what do you immediately do? You let go. You don't keep your hand on the hot skillet. So the intercept muscle does for you emotionally and psychologically, um, does for you emotionally and psychologically what, you, what, you, what happens when you experience negative feelings or thoughts, what your nerves do for your body. Let me say that again. The intercept muscle does for you what your instinct does when you grab a hot, the hot handle or you touch something. So only instead of it not being a physical hurt, it's when you experience negative feelings or thoughts. That's, and you re respond to them. That's the intercept muscle. So when I experience something that that's, that physically painful, I withdraw, I pull back, I, I, I move my, I take my hand off. My nerves tell me, let go, drop it. So the intercept muscle does, is, it does the same thing for us when we develop it, when we experience negative feelings or thoughts. So you have to go talk to somebody who you have a little bit of fear about talking to. So um, you're feeling the nervousness, you're feeling you might be judged, okay? That's a negative feeling. That's when you want your intercept muscle to kick in, okay? That's the intercept muscle. What the intercept muscle actually does is it interrupts the neural response, the, the emotional or psychological pain from going to the saboteur side of your brain by creating a pause. So in this drawing, this is a neural pathway. So an event happens, something, and the event, you know, it's processed along the neural pathway and it gets to a point where it has a choice to make. Am I going to go to the left brain, the saboteur side, or am I going to go to the right brain? So what happens over time is that 
we develop this pathway gets developed stronger and stronger if we respond more and more in a particular way. In other words, we talk, might talk about it in terms of developing a habit. We develop a habit. We try to intercept bad habits. I'm teaching kids a foreign language. I say to them, listen to me in my recordings make so that, and send me a recording of yourself so I can hear you, so I can intercept the bad habits you might be making because once we make bad habits, they're harder to break. This is the same in terms of how we respond with either our saboteurs or our sage powers. So the intercept muscle is basically a pause. It could be a pause where you just stop to breathe, um, pause to look at flowers, pause to, um, you know, that hum a song. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's something that you do to intercept that saboteur from hijacking you from being the effective leader that, that you want to be. Now let's get to the self command muscle. So the self command muscle. <clears throat> It's actually one of the really, it's right up there with that intercept muscle that you need to pay attention to. And by the way, I'm using the metaphor of, metal, of, of muscles um, in part because it is a metaphor, but it, and also because um, it works the same way as uh, developing your body, physical fitness. Right? Um, if you, you want to be a weightlifter or you want to you be a runner, you don't go out and do the most you can possible do the first time you build up to it. And some of the if you if you do any kind of weightlifting or work out with weights, you know that some of the exercises we do are very are very small moves are very simple ones, because they're developing important but small muscles, not so this is the same kind of thing so the self command muscle. is a really important muscle that you need to develop to as part of your leadership abilities. The key to the leader self command muscle is this. Let me see. I think I have a is a statement, and the statement is this. You want to ask yourself, what are the gifts and opportunities the situation that has triggered me, that has triggered my intercept muscle is giving me. So I want to present um, a belief statement. Maybe you'll agree with it. Maybe you won't. The belief statement is this. No matter the situation, doesn't matter what it is, it offers for you, it offers you the, a gift and opportunity. You just have to look really hard for it. And it may not become obvious um, er, very, uh, very early on. It may take a long time. Anything and everything that you could think of that's, that some really, really positive thing going on in the world started because of a, a lousy situation that somebody saw a gift, saw an opportunity to, to uh, develop something from. I'll give you a, a, an example that you all are experiencing right now. Africa Fire Mission. How did it come about? Not because somebody was sitting in an office in Cincinnati and saying, hey, I have this idea, let's develop this program. No, it happened because our, the direct, the founders, Nancy and her husband, were in Kenya and they saw this really terrible situation and they saw that it would provide an opportunity to create to create something and that's how Africa fire mission but anything out there is, uh, that people have created came from almost always came from a really bad situation so no matter what the situation doesn't matter how bad it looks there is a gift and opportunity in it waiting for you and that's what that's what the self command muscle is because once you ask yourself that question, now you're on your way to um, accessing your right side of your brain where your real creative powers, your sage powers reside. Okay. So now I wanna talk about the sage five sage powers. <clears throat> and again, I wanna say, you may be wondering what all this has to do with leadership training because I haven't really talked about leadership training or leadership the way we're used to hearing it talk about. I'm not listing the characteristics of a good leader, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I hope you're seeing where there, this might be going. So all the essential skills required to be a good leader can be summarized or reduced to these five sage powers. So what you need to understand are these five sage powers, but it's not about, um, 
So what are they and why are they important? But it's how you access them. And that's what the whole brain, that's what the, the stuff that I've been talking about in terms of training the brain to access these things. In other words, to have all the qualities and skills to be a good leader that we learn about at workshops and so forth, we have to be able to access these five sage powers. So five, sage power number one is empathy. It's unconditional Empathy is unconditional love for the self and others. That sometimes is really hard to do, but it's really important because empathy helps you understand other people around you. You're a leader. You gotta, you're working with someone who's not, you know, who's causing some tensions. Empathy is a sage power. If you, if you access it, invites you to relate to the person, try to understand what's going on with them. But you also have to have empathy for yourself. You have to treat yourself with kindness. Sage power number two is explore. You need to be curious. You need to be open. You need to wonder without judgment. What do I mean by wonder without judgment? I mean, you want to wonder with discernment. You know, in, in the religious world, we, we talk about we talk about judgment. We will be judged for our behaviors, blah, blah, blah. We also talk about discernment. What is discernment? Discernment is trying to, to figure out what it is the spiritual entity that we believe in wants from us. It's, it's not judging, it's discerning. So what you want to do is you want to explore. You want to access the power of part of your brain where you're curious, where you're open to wonder, you're open to, to understand, and you're doing all this without judgment. Number three, when you access the right side of your brain, this, you act, can access the sage power of, of innovate, which means imagining or inventing or thinking outside of the box, thinking about a new way of doing things. As a leader, you wanna think about new ways, better ways to inspire your, the people you lead with or, to, uh, or that you're in relationship with. Um, so you're looking for new ideas. You're not doing the same old thing time after time. Your fourth sage power is to what we call navigate. Navigate is you're using all these different sage powers and you're determining, discerning a path that'll give you your life meaning or will make your organization meaningful. And you'll see where I'm going with this in just a second. And lastly, it's activate. And that's the fifth sage power. And activate means to, to operate, to function, to, to aim towards a goal with a clear mind and laser focus. Okay. I've laid this out. Now, this is, this is what you need to develop in order to be a good leader. It's not about all those other characteristics. And how do you do this? You do this by using your intercept muscle and, you, and the, and the um, um, self-command muscles. And I'm gonna give you the exercise routine for how to develop those as we move forward. Now I wanna get into specifically to talk about leadership with you, okay? I'm going to, what I'm going to call, I'm, I'm going to call these the four steps of leadership. They sort of build on top of each other, but you can't really have one without the other. So in a way, they're also pillars. Now that you understand a little bit about how our brain works and why it is so important to train ourselves to operate from the right side of the brain, or what two weeks ago I called the strive brain, as opposed to the, I mean, the, the thrive brain, as opposed to the, 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 uh, the uh, survive brain. I want to introduce you to the four steps of leadership. Mm, okay, I'm going the wrong way. How'd that happen? Oh, hold on. There we go. Step number one in these four steps of leadership is something I call triple purpose. There are three kinds of purpose. When I mean purpose, I mean purpose of, of your mission, person, pur purpose of what you do. Number one is to have a positive impact on the self. Number two is to have a positive in impact on the other. And number three is to have a positive impact on, on uh, when I say each other, I mean your team members, okay? But a positive impact on others, I'm talking about your clients, your community members. So in other words, number one, as a leader, 
And this doesn't matter what position you are in, in the, the hierarchy, but as a leader, you're striving to, 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 to access to fulfill these three purposes. If it's not, an, um, if what you're doing, the purpose doesn't satisfy you, doesn't have an impact on your life, you're not going to be motivated. You're not going to be inspired. If what you're doing doesn't have a, a positive impact on your team members, you're not going to be inspired. They're not going to inspire you. And lastly, if you feel like what you're doing doesn't have an impact on the world around you, it's not going to, you're not going to be inspired and not going to be motivated. So you have to have you, numbers, the number one step in this process is that whatever you're doing, it needs to have these three kinds of purposes. Am I growing in a positive and meaningful way with, with what I'm doing? Am I helping to make a difference? Am I making a difference to my community members? As a leader, you want to be focused on creating a culture that embraces these three purposes. Notice the emphasis on the word positive. Use the intercept and self-command muscles as your best and first defense against negative feelings that can hijack your sense of self, other, or purpose. You see now, you're starting to see now where the saboteurs undermine our positive impact on ourselves and positive impact others. Saboteurs are almost always negative influences in our lives. The third step is this, it's called earn trust. Trust is not something that, that you just get. You don't, just because you have a title doesn't mean people are gonna trust you. Trust has to be earned. It's not a given. And the currency of exchange for earning trust is vulnerability. Vulnerability means daring to be fully authentic and transparent. Vulnerability is an act of courage and strength. Here you want to double down on the leadership quality of empathy because it promotes a caring culture where people appreciate and feel safe to be vulnerable and authentic. The sage power for earned trust is empathize. If you can't empathize with others, it's going to be hard to be vulnerable. It's going to be hard for them to trust you. Hard for you to trust yourself. Empathy is the action of understanding, of being aware, of being sensitive to and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts of another. We can also express empathy towards ourselves by being in touch with our feelings and treating ourselves kindly. The third step in the leadership is healthy conflict. Does, health, does the phrase healthy conflict seem like a contradiction in terms to you? Is there really such a thing as a healthy conflict? Well, in fact, there is. So here's a reality check. Conflict is inevitable between people. So there are two kinds of conflict, healthy conflict and unhealthy conflict. Let me talk about unhealthy conflict first. Unhealthy conflict is driven by various unpleasant feelings that are based or emanating in your left brain. I could go down deeply into what I'm, you know, into examples of this, but I'm going to suffice it. I'm going to trust that you understand enough of what I mean when I say those unpleasant feelings. If I'm feeling judged, for example, that's going to be, that's an unpleasant feeling. If I'm feeling Hyper, you know, unsafe, I'm hypervigilant, that's an unsent, uh, uncomfortable feeling. All those saboteurs that I described, they're based in the left brain, and those are what create the, the, the tensions in an unhealthy conflict. Among other negative effects of, and, uh, of these saboteurs in an unhealthy conflict is the erosion of trust. It makes it harder to be open and vulnerable. Um, when you're around people, when you're in unhealthy conflicts. It's also unhealthy physically for you. It increases your heart rate, it makes you feel stressed. 
intense. So unhealthy conflict, yeah, it's it's real. So healthy conflict and unhealthy conflict. Unhealthy conflict also means we avoid dealing with the problem. I'm sure every one of you can relate to that in some sense. You know, there's someone you feel like you got to talk to them about, but you just want to avoid it. And a lot of unhealthy conflicts come from excessive control. There's conflict because you're not doing what I want you to do. I can't control you. I have a friend that I'm dealing with his, with his teenage son. He can't get his teenage son to put his, his cell phone down. They're having a battle of controls. Guess who's winning? It's not the dad. Sometimes unhealthy conflicts come from unhealthy ple from uh, excessive pleasing. I don't tell you that what you're doing is wrong because I don't want to upset you. Or I don't tell you what you're doing is really driving me crazy because I don't want to upset you. So I try pleasing you. But in the end, nobody's happy. And unhealthy conflicts don't validate people's feelings. If I'm just on yelling at you and screaming at you, you know, I'm, I'm not validating, I'm not empathizing with your feelings. So, and lastly, unhealthy conflict almost always goes along with not listening. And what's one of the number one skills that every leadership training tells you you need to do? You need to be a better listener. You need to be a good listener. All this does is bring, all this, what I've been talking about brings me up to step number four, and that's mutual accountability. Old-fashioned leadership is supposed to hold everyone accountable for conduct and results. It's top-down, right? You guys all know about that, top-down. It's what the chief says. It's what the boss says. But the truth is, this is a super inefficient way because no leader can be everywhere. So instead of a top-down system, what we want are all team members to, to hold everyone accountable. All have buy-in. Mutual accountability is actually a gift we give to one another. Accountability is not about punishing or about, or nor it's also not about something negative. And with triple purpose, I can't do this without holding others accountable, right? For the sake of you growing, I owe it to you to help you with mutual accountability. It's a gift because I care about you. You see now how the, all the four steps come together. Everybody has buy-in because that's what we're striving for. And it's not about punishing. It's about triple purpose. It's a gift that we're giving to one another. So how do I actually build my brain muscles? Here it is. Here's the workout routine for you. Exercise number one. You're not going to do it now, but you'll have access to this and, uh, I, uh, I could put these together in a handout and we could get them emailed out to you later uh, or make them available somehow. So exercise number one, building the self-command muscle. This is what you do. You sit in a comfortable chair and you close your eyes and you take, a, take two or three deep breaths and you shift as much of your attention as you can onto your body and any of your five senses, or I should say, or any of your five senses. And for one to two minutes, you do this three times a day. You know, you're probably thinking, um, well, that sounds pretty silly and pretty simple. I don't understand what this is all about. <laughs> well, what you're doing is you're training your self-command muscle because the other thing you want to do while you're doing this is you're focusing on some part of your body or your breath as you're asking yourself, what is the situation, the negative emotion, giving me an opportunity to learn or explore or the skill to develop. So you're doing this kind of in combination. It sounds really simple and it is. You do two or three times a day, two or three minutes at a time or one to two minutes at a time and you're actually developing the self-command muscle. <clears throat> so I, when I was doing more weightlifting, there was a certain exercise that uh, my, uh, my trainer was telling me about it was a really, really simple thing. He said, you're not going to really notice any imp impact of this, but it's developing a really small muscle that's really important for your shoulder for stabilization. So don't dismiss these simple little exercises I'm going to give you as like, how is that going to help me make, become a better leader? 
you will see over time. And by the way, don't expect results overnight. Like any training program, it takes time. Okay, exercise number two, building the intercept saboteur's muscle. When you feel negative emotions, any unpleasant feeling, something that just doesn't quite feel right, rub two fingers together, just like this. Take two or three breaths and focus on something else. Your objective is to get your hand off the hot stove. And you do that by you're intercepting those saboteurs that are coming along with those negative feelings and you're shifting your brain to the right side by giving it a chance to pause. And remember, as you get a little more practice of this, you're going to add into this the question, what is the gift and opportunity this situation is giving me? So you're doing them kind of both simultaneously. Um, so it's really one exercise and two exercises, and you interweave them together. But what you're doing is you're intercepting the, the saboteur, and then you're also developing that command muscle to shift you over to the bright side of the brain. Exercise number three. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It's called the magic five to one ratio for building empathy. As I said, quality leadership is about quality leadership is about is about relationship building. Relationships where there are five positive interactions to every one negative interaction are healthier, stronger, and more productive. So if you want to inspire someone, if you want them to, 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 to trust you, then you need to build the relationship and by simply saying five times a day to somebody something nice good job good morning how are your kids or you smile at them or you give them an affirming pat on the back or you say oh, yeah, well, i like how you handled that you know five simple things and you're going to build your relationship because you're building empathy and you're building a sense of, of mutual um you know, association. Okay, exercise four. Now you're going to start working on rewiring your brain. Similar to one and two, you're going to sit in a comfortable chair. You're going to close your eyes and you're going to take two or three deep breaths. This is all about getting you settled so you could shift. Now you're going to remember a time when you didn't respond in a positive way to a situation. Remember what it was. Oh, I had an argument with my wife. Okay, now I'm gonna reimagine the, the situation, but now I'm gonna respond in my imagination in a positive and constructive way. Do this for a couple of minutes. You could do all these exercises as often as you want, or you could do them, you know, just each of these uh, three times a day, something like that, it doesn't matter. So when I was a kid, Sports psychologists were playing around with this idea of uh, imagining yourself doing the sport event that you want to do, but just do it in your head. Go, go through the practice. And my sport was ice hockey. So I'd go around my house and I'd pretend I was skating. I was pretend I was shooting, my, shooting the puck. Right? So that was, just, that was just a theory people have. We now know through brain mapping that when you reimagine um, your actions, your behavior, it actually does help rewire your brain. So they were right. They just didn't know that they were why they were right. So it also works with imagine a situation where you didn't handle it well, and now reimagine it with you doing it in a way that you want to see it done using your sage powers. Exercise number five. Again, you're rewiring your brain. This time, you're going to imagine a situation in the next few hours when you might be hijacked by your saboteurs. Who knows which one it'll be? And I'll tell you a way you can find out about your saboteurs uh, at the end. Um, now, imagine going into that situation with you responding in a more positive way, in a constructive way, in a way in which you are not hijacked by your saboteurs. Friends, to be a great leader, you need to understand how you think and act and how your behavior affects others. Parenthetically, we now know that there's something called neuro mirroring. 
we've all had the experience of somebody I'll, I'll i'm going to single out jose jose walks into the room and everybody lights up why because jose just he just is always you know exuberant he's always you know full of you know kind of gra- gratefulness and, and 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 joy we also know people when they walk into the room and they're downers that's because there's this thing called neuro mirroring and we're picking up on this and we're that neuro mirroring is either helping us go to the left brain or the right brain so how, knowing how you think and act and, and and how it affects others is really important and to grow as a leader requires a continuous journey of personal development leaders inspire others into effective action to achieve shared goals leadership is not a title to lead, you must be able to connect, motivate, and inspire others. So I want to thank you for attending today's training. Thank you for caring for your community. Thank you for being willing to be totally introduced to something radically new and different uh, from uh, in terms of leadership training. And before I, uh, I totally conclude, uh, oh, I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Oh, so I just want to share, this is, this is me. Take a quick look at that, who I am. Um, and uh, um, if you want to learn more about this, I'll tell you how to how, how we can. And now I'm going to stop my sharing, my screen sharing, and if I might. And as I promised, I'm going to teach you how to do a trick, and I'm going to show you another one. And then we'll wrap up. So I made the knot, and I'm going to slip into the toilet paper roll. But look the back of the toilet paper roll, there's a hole. And what I do is I stick my thumb inside that hole. And when I'm sticking my thumb inside the hole, I'm actually sticking it into the knot. And then when I pull up, the knot disappears. Here's why. Okay, here's the knot. Here's my thumb. Watch what happens when I pull the rope up. You see, it's a simple trick. You can do it. Um, All you need is a toilet paper roll and you cut a hole out. Now, I'm gonna show you one last trick. This will be a special interest for those of you who live in Kenya. You see what I have here? $50. See what I have here? I have this device. I I don't know. If my camera and my pictures are different places. Let me do this. Hold on a second. Here we go. Okay. And I have this magical device. I'm going to put this $50 Kenya note in here. And watch what happens. I turned it into a hundred Kenya shillings. I hope you um, are impressed with that trick. And uh, it's how I managed to afford to buy things when I'm in Nairobi, because I can turn $50 shillings into a hundred shillings. So on that note, I uh, thank you again for being here. And uh, I um, hope you have questions. I'll be happy to answer them and make myself available in tea time and at future interactions. So cheers and thanks again. And thanks for all you do for your community and for your uh, fellow first responders and for yourselves and your family, making them safe. Excellent. Thank you, Howard. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come and join us. Uh, not only did you give us a great class about leadership, but you taught these guys how to double their money too. So uh, investment advice and uh and training all in one. Uh, at this point in time, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, if there's, I see a couple comments in the chat um, asking about uh, uh, copies of the presentation. Um, if you keep an eye on that link to the Google Drive that I placed in the chat um, a little bit earlier, um, that's where you'll be able to find this. Um, we'll get that posted in a folder that says additional class materials. Uh, you can also find our training materials on AFM's website. If you go to africafiremission.org, 
under the resources tab, there's all sorts of great training information for you guys. It's all free. Um, if you go to 2024 virtual trainings, that's the link to that uh, to that Google Drive in case you can't copy that link if you're watching on a phone or something. So I encourage you all to go there and check that out as well. Uh, if you've got any questions, I would encourage you to uh, raise your hand, uh, wave at the camera, uh, or unmute yourself and ask your question. So I'm uh, I'm putting a couple of links in in the chat for you for you all. Um, if you want to learn more about um, the saboteurs, I've, I've got a um, I'm going to put a link to where you can do a an assessment of your set personal saboteurs. And although I'll probably get chastised by Nancy Nancy and Mike for doing this, I've also given you a um, uh, a link to my website where I for leadership training. Um, so if you have if you want to check that out and you want to contact me, you can do that. Um, like I said, I'll, technically we're supposed to make everything go through AFM, but I'm I'm going to go out on a limb. So I've sent that to you guys. I also want to say I, I know that I've. Well, um, I, I uh, basically I turned the fire hose on you with a whole lot of new information uh, and it may have been too much to process at one time. Uh, I also want people to understand that the information I gave to you, number one, it's not original. Uh, it's from the trainings that I've experienced and it's also not cultural um, specific. Um, this this training has been has been vetted throughout the world um, in uh, you know, and, and the contents it's been translated into 90 different languages and and there are people all over the world teaching this kind of uh, a, approach to leadership and uh, mental fitness um, which is not the kind of mental fitness jose was talking about but uh, it's a it's a different kind of me mental fitness all righty thank you howard i think what we'll do at this point in time is uh, wrap up the formal portion of our training with a thank you to all of our participants, thank you for what you do for your community, for taking the time out of your schedules, for spending your, your money on your bundles to be here with us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, everything you do for your communities. Uh, thanks to Howard for all the great work that he does for us, coordinating all of these virtual trainings, arranging our instructors, and then all of the teaching that he's been doing for us for these past few weeks. Howard, much appreciated. Uh, I would encourage you all to uh, invite your colleagues uh, share a screen with them, uh, share that registration link, uh, spread the word about these classes. We've got plenty of extra seats uh, in the classroom. Uh, so invite everyone you know to come and join us that, that may benefit from this training. I hope to see you all again next week.